Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to this webinar on standard practice for military packaging. I'm Mary McGovern of the Association of Procurement Technical Assistance Center, and along with our Region 6 and 7 directors, Mary Turner and Clint Doherty, I'm pleased to have Doug Jokinen, who's a packaging specialist assigned to the Defense Contract Management Agency Logistics and Safety Center, with us today to help us understand the organization of packaging documentation and where you can find information about it. All participants are in listen-only mode to minimize background noise and feedback and to ensure a more productive webinar for everyone. If you have questions, please submit them through the question feature, which is in the GoToWebinar panel on the right of your screen. Uh, Mary Turner will feed the questions to Doug at a couple of different intervals, a couple of different breaks in the webinar so that he can answer them for everyone's benefit. After the webinar, a very brief evaluation survey will appear. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete it, uh, to give us some feedback about how we can improve these kinds of offerings for you in the future. And, uh, oh, final note, uh, we will be recording this webinar. Hopefully the recording will turn out well. Uh, and if so, we will make it available through PCAC upon request. So um, vendors, if, if you would like to have access to it, please just contact your PTAC counselor and they can help you get it. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce and hand off the president, I'm sorry, hand off the presentation to Doug Jokeman. Doug? Good morning. Thank you, Mary. Thanks for joining us, all, the, all of you out there this morning for this uh, presentation on military packaging requirements. We've got quite a few slides to work our way through here, but I'm just trying to give you some information on the organization of the military standard that's used by the various buying activities um, for the services, the Army, the Air Force, Navy, Defense Logistics Agency, and the procurement of material for our troops uh, worldwide. And so we'll go through the document um, in general terms, if you've got two screens and you want to open up a copy of the document, um, feel free to do so. It might help you to kind of guide your way through this presentation. It does really follow almost uh, page by page the organization of the standard itself. For, uh, next slide, please. Here's a look at our agenda. We'll take a look again at the organization of the Mill Standard 2073-1. It's organized, uh, as all military standards are, um, by definition into six um, numbered sections. Number one is the scope, two is the applicable documents, three contains key definitions that are applicable to the subject at hand, four contains general requirements, five is detailed requirements specific to certain uh, topics or areas of information, and six are notes that can be of value in explaining the, uh, the specification requirements. There's also various appendixes that are included with Mill Standard 2073. There's nine that are included in the current revision, and they're identified alphabetically A through J. And we'll take a look at the individual appendices and the uh, information contained therein as well. Next slide. So section one of the standard is the scope, and it, the purpose outlines uh, for Mill Standard 2073 is stated as it outlines standard processes for the development and documentation of military packaging requirements. It defines methods of preservation to protect material from environmentally induced corrosion and deterioration, and it applies to items for which military packaging is required to meet operational demand. So that's stated right in the first section, uh, uh, section number one of the Mill Standard 2073. Uh, next slide. Section two identifies applicable documents that are referenced within the standard. It lists federal specifications, commercial item descriptions, DOD specifications and standards, other government documents and non-government commercial type publications. It also includes an order of precedent that identifies if there is a conflict between the text of Mill Standard 2073 and the reference cited here. The text of Mill Standard 2073 takes precedence. However, 
Nothing in this document supersedes applicable laws and regulations unless a specific exemption has been obtained. So, for instance, uh, in shipping hazardous materials in accordance with the regulations of CFR 49, even though you may have a military packaging reference or requirement, those would not supersede or conflict, hopefully not conflict with the mill standard or the CFR 49 hazardous materials regulations. We don't want to be violating some federal regulation or law on hazardous material with one of our packaging instructions. And so, for instance, with hazardous materials, we generally defer to the applicable modal requirements of the uh, mode of transportation. Next slide, please. Section 3 includes many definitions that are applicable to military packaging requirements. Some of the terms that you'll see used throughout the document are the categorization process. That's the process of evaluating an item by chemical and physical characteristics to determine the preservation requirements. Electrostatic discharge sensitive items like circuit boards um, that need extra protection to, uh, especially this time of the year, with the low humidity and all the static electricity around, uh, there are specific ESD requirements identified in MIL Standard 2073. Military packaging is a means for specifying preservation and packing. There's really two components to military packaging, a preservation requirement and a packing requirement to ensure the item is not degraded during shipment and storage. Next slide, please. Uh, addition, additional definitions, military preservation, the first part of the, uh, the requirement is the application of materials or methods designed to protect an item during shipment handling, indeterminate storage, and distribution to kinds of needs worldwide. There are two levels of packing that are also identified in the military application. Level A is the maximum protection required to meet severe worldwide shipment handling and storage conditions. Level B is to meet moderate worldwide shipment handling and storage conditions. The level typical containers used to meet a level B pack would include domestic wood boxes and weather resistant fiberboard boxes and fast pack containers. And we'll take a look at some of those different types of containers uh, later on. Next slide, please. Here's a pictorial look at the military packaging requirements. The entire loop from the right side, starting at the top of the right, the cleaning, drying, preserving, is the military preservation requirements that you'll typically see defined in, in a DOD contract. On the left side is the packing operations, and again, those will also typically be defined, although usually not at the level of detail that the preservation requirements are typically called out. Again, it can be conditional, though, because certain items, um, because of their size and weight, uh, the preservation requirement leads right into their, if they're a large type item packed into a wood box or crate, for example, the preservation leads right to the packing accomplishment as well as the unit container typically becomes your shipping container. Next slide. Section 4 contains general requirements applicable to military preservation and packing. It, it gives you the direction to use a de decision chart that's included in the mill standard for development of military packaging requirements. Those are norm that process is normally accomplished at the buying activity prior to solicitation, and, and they will use that procedure then to identify the applicable packaging requirements for those specific items being procured under that contract. Again, hazardous materials, we tend to, rather than specifying a military package, defer to the hazmat regulations. There's a reference for classified items, secret, top secret, sensitive type items, uh, as far as packaging and marking requirements applicable to those. There's a Appendix B formula for development of the quantity per unit pack, although in 99.4900% of the time, it's going to be specified in the solicitation in the contract for the quantity per unit pack. That's something that we want to identify and specify so that when the material gets into one of our storage depots, it's in a configuration as far as the quantity that goes, that it can be issued directly to the field without having to be broken down 
and repackaged to meet or fill requisitions from our warehouse. This Appendix C includes container requirements, both interior and exterior shipping containers applicable to the different levels of packing. Loose fill material, um, the most common form of which most people can identify with, would be the styrofoam type peanuts. That type of loose fill is prohibited in military packaging with the exception of hazardous materials that might require a vermiculite in a liquid, uh, hazmat liquid that's being shipped uh, to absorb it in case there's any uh, leakage, particularly for the air mode of transportation. Oftentimes those packages will require uh, has our liquid absorbent material to be built into the package in case there is any leakage. And then there's a table one included uh, at the back of the section that identifies the typical fragility factors of certain items uh, by uh, kind of a generic description of those items. Also information on kits being packaged in accordance with Appendix D. Uh, and a variety of other information that's included in the general requirements of Section 4 of Mill Standard 2073. Next slide, please. Section 5 is the detailed requirements section. Military packaging shall be a minimum cost consistent with the required performance. Also defined in Section 5 are five basic methods of preservation, and they are numerically identified in order of least amount of protection to um, the greatest amount of protection. Ten being the least amount of protection applicable to an item means there's no environmental protection. The item is not susceptible to damage from the environment um, other than physical shock, vibration, that sort of thing. And so whatever cushioning um, or blocking, bracing, protection the item requires, if there's no environmental requirement, it, maybe it's a completely painted bracket assembly or a plastic item, um, those would be preserved what we call the method 10, just physical protection to get it into the container, whatever that happens to be, and then uh, uh, cushion and, and block and brace as, as required to protect that item. Method 20 is the all the all the basic methods include the basic method 10. You always have to cushion or block and brace or physically protect the item. But then 20 adds a grease or oil to prevent an item from rusting or corroding. So for example, if you had a, um, a pair of pliers or some sort of tool, you might put a light oil on it to keep it from rusting in, in, uh, in long-term storage and then maybe a grease proof wrap to keep the oil from seeping through the box and looking like an old pizza box in a couple of weeks. You, that would be a method 20 application. Method 30s are waterproof or waterproof grease proof <laughs> type uh, methods and the method 30s, 40s and 50s include sub method designations which further define the package. For instance, a method 31 is a waterproof type preservation. A method 32 is a waterproof grease proof type preservation. Uh, or 33 is a waterproof grease proof preservation. A method 32 is an item wrapped, cushioned and boxed and then having a waterproof enclosure sealed around it. So you can see that they're all just variations of a waterproof or waterproof grease proof application under that method 30 designation. And 40s are the same way except that you uh, go from a waterproof which might be a polyethylene type film that would exclude liquid water but not water vapor. Whereas in the method 40, the bags that we typically use then to create or uh, establish that water vapor proof enclosure um, are like a, either a foil laminated or some type of plastic laminated film that excludes the water vapor from being transmitted from outside that sealed bag to the interior, protecting the item from the, one of the main causes of, of corrosion and, and long-term storage, the exposure to elevated water vapor on critical type surfaces. And method 50s are basically the same type um, preservation methods as the 40s, 
but you've added a desiccant, uh, some sort of a silica gel or drying agent, along with a, uh, uh, a humidity indicator card inside that Method 50 preservation requirement. Next slide, please. Additional information in the detailed Section 5 requirements. Preservation method shall be as specified in the contract. When not specified, the appropriate method shall be selected in accordance with Appendix A. And we'll discuss what information is available in Appendix A, but that's where the categorization process that was defined in Section 3 uh, actually takes place. And again, that is typically handled with the buying activities when they're defining the applicable packaging requirements for whatever item, uh, NSN, or how they've identified, however they've identified that specific item on the solicitation or contract. Uh, typically, we'll have uh, Mill Standard 2073 military preservation requirements uh, assigned to them, and, and the procedure that they follow is generally laid out in the uh, Appendix A. If it's not specified in the contract, and they just say military preservation in accordance with Mill Standard 2073, then it, the ball's in the contractor's court to go into that Appendix A, go through the various tables of characteristics and categorize the item to develop the appropriate preservation method for that type of an item. Also included in Section 5 are some other detailed requirements. Protection from physical damage is required for all methods. Again, that's really stating, uh, again, that the basic preservation method 10 is really an inherent part of all the other preservation methods. We have to take care of the physical, mechanical uh, susceptibility to damage as part of our pack design. If you've got a box that you're putting inside a sealed bag, you should blunt the corners of the, the box before you slide into the bag so that it doesn't tear up the bag. Uh, remove trapped air from heat sealed bags so that you're not shipping a bunch of pillows or, or a volume of, of air that for delivery to the destination. Electrostatic discharge preserved items shall be packaged in accordance with a specialized preservation method code that's defined in Table J1A and Appendix J, GX, uh, gives you the acceptable methods for wraps, cushioning, and, and it has to be heat sealed in a shielded, water vapor proof ESD protective bag. And that's all laid out in the, in the narrative in that GX uh, preservation method definition. Again, hazardous materials, they, they, bail, they identify that the packaging preservation method coded should be HM, which really sends you to the applicable uh, modal regulations for hazardous materials shipments, CFR 49, IATA for the air, commercial air shipments, the IMDG for ocean movement. Interior bags require unit container markings when they're heat sealed to accomplish a specified preservation method, 30s, 40s, or 50s. Uh, the choose shipping containers in accordance with the table C2 in Appendix C. And the contractor is responsible for performing all quality assurance requirements as specified in Appendix G. And we'll take a quick look at some of those requirements once we get into the Appendix G uh, references. Next slide, please. Additional information in Section 5, Level A and B packing requirements. There's some general requirements that uh, are, are called out here. Intermediate containers shall be used when the quantity to be shipped to a single destination permits the use of two or more intermediate containers in an exterior container. And when the exterior surface of the unit pack is a bag or a wrap. When practicable, exterior containers being shipped to a single destination shall contain items of the same national stock number, contain identical quantities of the unit intermediate pack, contain items of the same contract, contain items of the same lot, number, cure, manufacturer, or expiration date for shelf life items, and be cost effective in minimum cube to contain and protect the items. So these are just some general references um, applicable to the packing requirements called out in the contract and good information to keep in mind as you're assembling your shipment. They'd like to have uniform quantities packed into the containers at the destination because it makes it much easier for them to deal with in the warehouse as far as 
um, storing and pulling in items for uh, shipment and, and inventory purposes as well. Next slide, please. Additional information in Section 5 identifies when military packaging design validation testing would be required. The contractor shall be required to perform design validation tests in accordance with Appendix F unless, and here's the criteria, detailed packaging instructions or design are furnished by the acquisition activity in the solicitation or contract data, previous successful test records for the same or similar item, approved engineering data establishes that the item will be properly protected in the proposed pack, multi-application type containers, so if we've got a generic fast pack, uh, it's a fireboard box that has glued molded cushioning into it, and if your item fits within the size and weight and fragility requirements of that fast pack, then there's no need to do any sort of design validation testing. And the last bullet, contractor historical shipping data confirming adequate protection is provided to similar items using the same or equivalent type packaging. Next slide, please. Section 6, the last section of the military standard numeric um, basic standard requirements is the notes. And in, in MIL standard 2073, there is some helpful information that's included. Uh, they list various paragraph 6.8 identifies superseded methods of preservation. So if by chance you end up with a historic reference to a method of preservation that doesn't quite match what's what's in our system or mill standard 2073 today, you could go through the t paragraph and identify what has been superseded, uh, what which ones have been phased out or replaced, and that information is also included back in your tables in Appendix J. Table 1 has the fragility factors for certain items. Table 2 is a, a, has good information on container bag material cross-referencing to our specification that we use for the fabrication of, of bags, the MIL DTL 117. And then there's also some information on the utilization of military or versus a commercial packaging requirement. Next slide, please. Now here's a look at the Table 2 information. Um, and highlighted, you'll see preservation methods 32 and 33 on the uh, left-hand column. And in the MIL DTL reference, the bag reference, it actually comes out of the definitions for those preservation methods in Section 5 on the MIL Standard 2073. Type 3 Class C Style 1 Mill DTL 117 bag is, is made from the material identified as Mill PRF 121 Type 2 material, waterproof, greaseproof, opaque. And the unit container bag code would be um, BV as shown in the far right hand column. So, what I tried to show here in the um, with the pictures is the roll of material that you see on the left um, is the mill PRF 121 material. And in the picture, the bags fabricated from that 121, the, the red markings are, are printed on that roll when that roll is laminated at the, the manufacturer. But the markings that you see in the black ink on there are the mill DTL 117 markings that are placed on that bag when it is fabricated from the bag converter utilizing the, the roll of barrier material that they purchase from the, the manufacturer. And they they mark that um, bag to indicate that they're complying with mill DTL 117 and it'll list the type class and style that is applicable along with the manufacturer's um, designation. In the, for that bag in the month and the year that it was fabricated. And I think at this point we're on our way into the appendixes, um, but before we do that, I'd like to stop in case there's uh, some questions that we can deal with, and uh, so hopefully we can, Mary can get those um, conveyed.
Currently, we just have one question, Doug, and it re okay. regards the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So I might refer this to Mary. Um, Susan Ballou is asking, will we have access to the PowerPoint presentation? And is that a, one thing that they should, another thing that they should contact you and you can disseminate that for them, Mary? Uh, yes. Just send a request to headquarters at asthackus.org, and I would be happy um, to forward the slides. And here again, if you're a vendor, go through your PTAC to request that slide presentation. So at this point, though, that's the only question that we have. Okay, very good. Hopefully it's not because I lost everybody trying to go through the document. But actually, once we get into the appendixes, that's where more, a lot more of the action is. So I'm optimistic that the second part of this presentation will generate some more questions. Uh, yeah, if there's nothing on the bag requirements, then we'll go. We'll move on to the appendix A. Next slide, please. And again, as alluded to earlier, Appendix A is what the buying activities typically use to identify, categorize, um, and develop their military packaging requirements. It includes a variety of tables that you set you through the categorization process. There's also included um, predetermined packaging codes. If you get through the tables A1, 2, and 3, and none of your assigned codes are a Z, um, then your item is what they call a common type item under 10 pounds, uh, rugged, non-fragile non type piece of equipment, maybe common hardware or, or whatever. And that categorization process leads you to um, the predetermined packaging codes for those items. So the buying activities don't even have to you know, select a preservation method and applicable wraps, cushioning, dunnage, uh, unit containers, that's all spelled out in that table uh, A Roman numeral 4 for those types of items. Then there's also some formulas for material um, size and weight information. Uh, if you have to fabricate uh, a bag and you're wondering what the size should be, you can go into the formulas there in table A5 and it'll take you to the um, Square, square inches typically of the barrier material required to complete a, a bag for uh, that particular item to complete the preservation method. It, it will add, for instance, for a method 50 requirement because it's the type that has the desiccant and the humidity indicator included uh, in the package. Those packages typically are opened up in storage every couple of years or so and have the desiccant removed and either dried out and replaced and the bag resealed. So those bags, when you have a preservation method 50, your bag should be an extra two inches longer than the method 30s or 40s would require. And that's built into the formula, as you'll see. Um, instead of adding three inches to the, the length and width figure, you add five inches to those. And that gives you a little extra room to, for the opening and, and resealing of the bags. And that information is all laid out in the Appendix A requirements. Again, most of the time, contractors are not required to have to go in there and do the categorization process and identify the applicable preservation method. That would be called out in the contract. But there are times when the buying activity maybe doesn't have any information on the item, and they know they want a military preservation requirement, so they'll just call out uh, Mill Standard 2073, uh, military preservation and whatever applicable packing level is call, is necessary and then uh, the expectation is that you work your way into this Appendix A and come up with the appropriate preservation method for the item in question. Next slide. Continuing on with the code development, again here's where they talk about the common selective and special group items. Uh, if you can get through the first three tables without any um, uh, Z codes that, that don't fit the criteria for the common items then, um, you do have that opportunity to use the predetermined packaging data in table A4. 
selective items don't fall under the criteria for a common item, but they're not quite at the level of definition necessary for special items. That the selective items have their uh, packaging defined utilizing the codes in Appendix J of Mill Standard 2073 with a supplemental information narrative if required. But special items, um, we'll see, have their own form that they're called out, a special packaging instruction. It may have a bill of materials and drawings and uh, a whole list of information telling you exactly how uh, that item is to be configured and, and packed to meet the military requirements. So those are the three different types of items that you, you get out of the uh, categorization process. Next slide. Also in Appendix A is this um, figure A1 that shows the format of the um, NELS standard 2073 coded data starting with uh, the method of preservation that are identified in table J1 and, and J1A is a specialized preservation. J1 is the basic middle standard 2073 preservation methods 10, 20, 31, 32, 33, the 41, 42, 43, 44, 45. Those, those are all in J1. Um, J1A are the specialized preservation methods such as the electrostatic discharge, ESD sensitive code GX, that definition will be found in J1A or the HM for the hazardous materials as two examples. But you can see it's a 12 position sequence that's identified um, in MIL standard 2073 for our coded packaging data. And this allows the bonding activities to specify their packaging requirements for hundreds, thousands, millions of items of military supply um, and, and keep that in their computer database against that national stock number. And then this information gets pulled out of their tech data and plugged into uh, the contract to specify packaging requirements for common or selective uh, items that have their packaging requirements specified or identified using coded packaging data. And this sequence from the first position over to the 12th is pretty well fixed. Some of the buying activities will have additional information either before or after this, but once you get to the preservation method, this this format and sequence should be followed by all the different Army, Air Force, Navy, and DLA buying activities to clarify the packaging required from preservation method, cleaning, preservative material, wrapping, cushioning and dunnage, cushioning thickness up to the unit container code. And you can see the various codes call out um, back in the tables in Appendix J. The definitions of those codes are what you see following those lines um, uh, down as far as what information is is called out. Uh, a neutral wrapping material to a mill detail 17667, the EA um, um, Definition, the, the definition for the LC cushioning code is uh, triple PC 795, cellular plastic film, most folks would refer to that as a bubble wrap material. Um, we've got federal specifications that covers uh, that type of material and there's a, a general type material class one and there's also a, a ESD protective uh, material that's typically uh, pink in color uh, in the bubble wrap format. Cushioning thickness codes um, are called out and then the unit container codes as well. Next slide. Appendix B is where we have information on the quantity per unit pack, QUP, and ICQ, the intermediate container quantity. Most times you're always going to have the quantity per unit pack identified in the contract. And it's likely going to be one whatever the unit of issue happens to be, zero, zero, one. If the unit of issue is each, then one each item goes into the unit 
pack. If the unit of issue is pair, your quantity per unit pack could be one, the unit of issue would be PR, and there would be a pair of items that make up the, the unit pack. Uh, there are formulas in there to establish the quantity per unit pack, but the buying activity folks are the ones that normally use that. The second bullet on this slide, the intermediate container quantity does come into play on many DOD contracts because it oftentimes is not specifically defined. It is required to be a maximum of 100 unit packs, 40 pounds, or one and a half cubic feet with at least two dimensions not exceeding 16 inches. The intermediate container is intended to facilitate manually handling, manual handling at the depot or warehouse location, so that's why it's limited to 40 pounds and one and a half cubic feet. And it's also to facilitate inventory of the items in, in storage. And so if we had bought, let's say, 30,000 washers packaged one each into a, a small heat sealed bag, let's say. Rather than, if we didn't have an intermediate container requirement, we could potentially get 30,000 washers stacked into a pallet box or a Gaylord type container. And if they were going to inventory that at the depot, they would have to count 30,000 bags. Well, if you take those 30,000 bags and put them into intermediate containers of 100, it's much, much easier for the folks to inventory that material and also to carry around uh, a, new, a quantity of those packaged items. Next slide. And also included in Appendix B is this table that provides you guidelines based upon the unit pack size and the unit pack weight. And they're both you know, geared towards that maximum limitation of 40 pounds and one and a half cubic feet. And so this slide shows you in multiples of four um, where you, your quantities would come for a, a, a intermediate container that's going to fall within those specified limitations. And the notes underneath the table give you information on how to apply that information. There are times when you will be given a specific number, uh, it depends on the buying activity, but they can call the quantity of unit packs that they specifically want in their intermediate container. So it does happen, but generally what you're going to see is the intermediate container quantity is going to be AAA, and that really sends you then into the Appendix B requirements to establish an intermediate container quantity that, that falls within the uh, limitations of 40 pounds, 100 unit packs, or one and a half cubic feet. Next slide. Appendix C is a container specification um, appendix, and it provides two tables, one C1, well, two tables that identify inter interior and exterior container requirements. C1 lists the interior containers that can be used for various unit packs um, unless otherwise specified in the coded data or packaging requirements. C2 lists various exterior containers to meet the level A or B packing requirements and which variations of those containers uh, are acceptable under different uh, under level A or B requirements. And uh, that packing requirement should be specified in the solicitation or contract. Sometimes it's strictly packing level A, packing level B, and then, and then you're going right into that table C2 to identify the appropriate shipping container. Uh, there's also packing codes listed in Appendix J that can give you more definition than, and, and are a little more specific than what's included in the uh, table C2 requirements. Next slide. Here's a look at the interior container um, table C1. And it lists different types of containers, paperboard boxes, tubes, bags, the mill DTL 117 bag specification that we talked about earlier. Um, if you over oversize um, from the 117 specification because the item is large or, or 
mounted to a, a anchored base type thing where you've got gaskets um, utilized to plug through there uh, to anchor the item down and you go through the bag. Then rather than the 117 bag specification, uh, you need to use the mill DTL 6060 spec for those types of uh, bags. And then 511A is a fireboard box specification, the domestic class um, are really like the round box maker certificate that you see on the bottom of the containers commercially. That's what would meet the, the class domestic uh, fiberboard box requirements. Next slide. Here's a look at part of table C2. It lists a variety of uh, containers that can be used to meet different levels of packing. Highlighted again is the fiberboard box specification, ASTM B5118, but in, our, in this case they're specifying weather resistant fiberboard uh, is necessary to meet the level B packing. It doesn't meet a level A packing requirement. Generally those are wooden containers um, or plastic or metal reusable type containers, but for level B packing, uh, weather resistant fiberboard, a B3C board, W5C, some of the double wall, B13, B11, um, those boxes are marked specifically with the ASTM D5118 designation and then the grade of the fiberboard, uh, weather resistant fiberboard that they're fabricated from. Next slide. Appendix D is where the information is um, located for the general requirements for development of military packaging for kits. There's some general rules in there. Uh, preservation shall be applied to all items within the kit. Methods of preservation shall be in accordance with Appendix A, so they can, and probably the most likely scenario where a contractor does find themselves in Appendix A to identify a preservation method because there are times when kits are uh, by, by, under contract with a reference to mill standard 2073 appendix D and, and no more uh, instruction or definition other than that. There's an out for the hazardous material requirement although it does allow that they be uh, they can be overpacked with the kit as long as they're compatible materials from a hazardous material shipment standpoint. And items of different characteristics can be consolidated within the same method of preservation um, as long as you're not um, creating a situation where the, the critical items could potentially degrade because you've included you know, too many of the non-critical non items within the same, same barrier. Kit content lists are required so that the folks in the field are able to identify the individual components within the, the kit itself. And so they can utilize that kit in the field and have confidence that they're able, they're, they've got the right washer or nut or whatever O-ring or other component within that kit. So identification of the, the material within that kit is, is critical for the folks on the other end. Next slide. Appendix E is where the packaging data forms are located. There's an old DOD form 2326, which is the old 80 card column, IBM card column format with four different parts for development and submittal of data. Uh, you don't see paper copies of this form like we used to. Typically, if contractors are developing packaging data, they would uh, electronically submit the information to the buying activity and there will usually be a, a document um, reference in the contract identifying the format that, that the buying activity wants that information transmitted back on. There used to be a DD form 2169 special packaging instruction that was used for all of the special items to identify uh, and it was like the lead page of a, a special package instruction. The last revision of Mill Standard 2073, revision E, dropped the form requirement and in, still includes or, or carries forward the content requirements, but now contractors are free to utilize any format as long as they include the required information. 
Next slide. Appendix F is a design validation test that we alluded to earlier, talking about when, when they would be applicable to a contractor. Uh, there's performance tests that are identified to an ASTM D4169. Um, and then it also references inspection requirements included in Appendix G, a visual examination, and leakage and heat seal seam tests for sealed um, barrier bags for the environmental protection requirements. And again, there's a little bit of an out for hazardous material requirements and when deferring to the modal regulations rather than the military requirements of 2073. Next slide. Appendix G are the quality assurance requirements applicable to military packaging. Uh, again, there's a visual uh, inspection table. There's a leak test specified to various um, test methods of MIL standard 3010 for the, the materials that have uh, uh, either waterproof, water vapor proof. Uh, or water rape proof with desiccant protection. Uh, different types of leak tests that are uh, acceptable. There's a heat seal seam test called out to test method 2024. Um, and intermediate and shipping containers should be examined for material construction size closure markings. So these are the quality requirements applicable to Milton standard 2073. And that's based upon the preservation method that's called out in the preservation requirement. Next slide. Here's a look at the uh, heat sealed seam test. Uh, depending upon the type of material that the bag is fabricated from, it gives you the uh, weight that's required to be suspended from that uh, test sample. At 36 ounces for the mill PRF 121 material, 50 ounces for uh, the polyethylene, um, and then and the water vapor proof milk PRF 131 and 22191 materials, and then the ESD materials uh, have a requirement for 56 ounces um, for their test weight. And a one inch strip is cut from the heat sealed area and hung for five minutes to establish the integrity of that heat sealed seam. Appendix H um, has to do with uh, container design and retrieval system. It's located at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. It is um, an attempt to prevent reinventing the wheel. If you do have a contract that requires the, the development or establishment of a, a reusable type container, um, they want that design to be or the designs that are at Eglin Air Force Base to be screened beforehand um, in case there's an existing design that could be either utilized as is or uh, modified slightly for whatever it is the item uh, that is under contract. And you'll see a contract requirement when, when the, this is required. Uh, identifying that the contractor contact these folks, submit technical data, and, and screen their items to see if there are potential matches there uh, in that existing database. Next slide. Appendix J is finally uh, the tables of all the codes that we talked about earlier, the preservation method codes, unit container codes, wrapping, uh, cushioning, and dunnage type information is all laid out in the appendix tables in appendix J. The part of a position and sequence system, again, it, it's critical that you you have the right code matched to the table that it was that was intended to to come from because if you have a method or if you have a code 10, it's going to mean a completely different thing if you're in the method preservation table or in the unit container table. And so the position of the code and the sequence that it falls in are, are critical to properly decoding coded packaging data uh, on a DOD or military standard 2073 requirement. Again, and, uh, next slide please. And this is the table again that came out of Appendix A that shows the coded data. 
and uh, across the upper part of the the table, you'll see the different um, table numbers: J1, J2, J3. Those are listed and in sequence back in the appendix for the applicable um, preservation methods. Next slide. J1 lists the preservation methods, and there's a, a, a table J1, and you can see is highlighted uh, method 42. It's a container, a water vapor proof bag sealed, and another container around that. And that, that preservation method 42 is, is depicted there in the pictures uh, on the left. And it used to be referred to, I, I talked earlier about some superseded data. It used to be referred to as a method 1A14 and had a different uh, code identified 3Q before we went to this numeric designation system that's in the MIL standard 2073 now. Next slide. J2 cleaning, cleaning and drying procedure codes. And again, this table has really shrunk down. There used to be information in here on ultrasonic cleaning, sandblasting, solvent degreasing, fingerprint removal. Now it's really down to these three codes. Code one, any suitable process. Z, special requirements. C, specific instructions or drawings. Or zero, no requirements. So generally, you're going to find a code one as in our requirements. But if you do have an item, say an, a liquid, an item that might be exposed to liquid oxygen in use, those are special clean type requirement items to ensure that there's no preservatives or oils, petroleum-based uh, compounds that might be residual on that item because it could result in an explosive situation. And so. Those would have a code Z on them, and it would send you to a drawing, typically, um, for the specialized cleaning procedures. Next slide. J3 is a contact preservative material codes. Um, this is just a small portion of the table. Um, zero, zero is no requirement for a preservative oil or grease. But there are a whole variety of codes that can be used to call out specific type oils, greases, lubes used as a preservative on the item to in long-term storage. Next slide. Wrapping material codes. You can see the EA code is a, a, a neutral wrapping material, MIL DTL 17667. The picture over on the right shows the blue lines that are part of that specification requirement to help you identify that that's a chemically neutral paper wrap. and then long-term storage, especially if we have metallic items um, that might not have uh, oil or grease preservative on them, but they might have some sort of a finish that does um, you know, protect them from corrosion. E even if they do have uh, some sort of CAD plating or zinc or some type of coating on them, we don't want to wrap them in like a standard craft type paper or have them come in contact with the fiberboard box directly because in long-term storage, even though it's a fairly uh, protected surface, um, those materials are typically acidic as part of their manufacturing process and can either discolor or accelerate some sort of corrosion in, in storage. And so on, on metal items, we typically look for a neutral, chemically neutral surface and, and that's why the 17667 paper uh, comes in handy as a, as a wrap to protect those items. Next slide. Uh, cushioning and dunnage, you can see we've highlighted the LC code. I've kind of tried to follow that code that was the default uh, information back in, in the Appendix A uh, figure. And so we can see we've worked our way down to the cushioning material, the bubble wrap that's specified by the triple PC. 795 and pictured there in the roll on the right. But you can see there's also a variety of cushioning material that can be called out in our, our coded packaging data, ranging from um, uh, polystyrene, uh, various types of bound fiber uh, cushioning or uh, bone cushioning materials, 
fiberboard pads, the 47, the ASTM D 4727. Uh, there's, there's still a fair amount of cushioning options available to the buying activity if they want to include those in their in their coated packaging requirements. Next slide. The cushioning thickness and uh, the code C was utilized in that in that example, three quarters of an inch thick. The information in the table lists the minimum thickness surrounding the item. Um, if there is addition, you can see in the note down below the table, any voids in the container resulting from oversized unit containers should be filled with additional cushioning to uh, keep them from any movement or, or within the, the unit box. Next slide. Unit intermediate container codes. Um, again, the one that was called out in the table is ED. It's an ASTM D5118 weather resistant corrugated fiberboard box. In the picture, you can see there's a, a box, the bottom of the box is identified with the applicable grade of the fiberboard that they're made out of. And note that they comply with the ASTM D5118 requirements for box fabrication. Next slide. Unit container level codes. Uh, in this case, the unit container level, the unit container was a weather resistant fireboard box, and so that box would meet a level B packing requirement. By definition, um, when we were looking in um, section or appendix C, um, under the Table 2 guidelines for Level B packing, the 5118 fireboard box is identified as a Level B pack. So that, that's the applicable code for this, this requirement. Next slide. Optional procedure indicator becomes a valuable code many times for contractors because it gives you an indication of what options are available without getting a, a modification or requesting a formal change to the contract. And in, in this case, with the O highlighted, the options can be exercised to the specific method of preservation. However, basic preservation method shall be retained. Supplemental data, if there are, is any, shall be complied with. Unit package dimensions shall not increase by more than one inch. Equal or better protection shall be given to the item and no increase in the package cost. Uh, a good example of this would be um, on that last code that we were looking at where they had bubble wrap called out for uh, the cushioning material. If a contractor doesn't normally stock bubble wrap in their shipping area, they use maybe the white um, microfoam type material, uh, polyethylene or polypropylene foam wrap materials can be substituted for that bubble wrap. It would be equal or better protection. Uh, as no additional cost to the government, and with an OPIO, you could make that sort of a substitution. Next slide. Packing requirements, um, and these uh, there's a whole series of codes and tables applicable to the J9A um, is is level A packing. Uh, J9B is uh, J9 is the level A packing, J9A is level B, and J9B is the minimal type packing requirement. In this case, with a code F under the level B packing requirements, it's an indication that the unit container shall also serve as a shipping container. So our weather resistant fireboard box can be used to uh, ship the, the material in question. Closure, sealing, and reinforcement shall be in accordance with the specification for the container. Next slide. Special marking codes, and you can see down below there's no special marking called out. There's a variety of codes that can be used um, to convey special markings, but when there's the zero, 00 code, no special markings, it means the general requirements of Mill Standard 129 apply. But none of these special codes that you see uh, included in this table are required. Next slide. There's a website that you can use to pull up the Mill Standard 2073 coded data. Uh, the site's listed there. 
you have to, again, here's a, a, a little bit of a warning. The data must be entered in the correct box because if you have the right code in the wrong box or the wrong code in the right box, you're going to get a different interpretation than what is intended um, by the folks that put that packaging data in that contract. Next slide. Here's a look at that website, uh, how it opens up when you when you actually get there, and you can see all the different boxes uh, to plug information. And if there's one of the fields included there, um, if you don't have that data, then just leave it blank. Plug in the information that you do have, and then hit the Get Packaging Data um, button down at the bottom of the page, and it will bring up the information. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is the actual definitions in the MIL standard 2073 are what's really applicable, but this is a handy uh, way to get a quick idea of the packaging required. And next slide, please. Here's the code that's been plugged in um, to this code lookup site, and then once all the information that's available is plugged in, you can hit where the red arrow is to get packaging data and Next slide, please. This is what uh, information comes back. It, a preser it gives you the definition of the DW preservation method code, cleaning and drying, one, the preservative material, 10, the wrapping material, the cushioning material, and A doesn't mean not applicable. In this case, it means you have a choice of bubble wrap or open cell plastic film or the uh, microfilm type. Uh, wrapping foam for your cushioning options. Next slide. Additional information that was included in the lookup that just didn't fit on the screen. The cushioning thickness, the unit container is the ED, um, the intermediate container, the zero, 00 down below it. Both the codes can be plugged into the same box on the code lookup, separated by a, a semicolon, and then it'll give you both of the definitions. So the ED is our weather resistant corrugated box of 5118. The 00, zero comes back as no requirement for an intermediate container. Pack code F information, the special marking 3 desiccant, um, and then the unit container level B and the optional procedure indicator O. Again, highlights that options can be exercised within certain limitations. Next slide. Okay, I think that wrapped up our slides. I kind of got clipped in there at the end, but I was running a little bit long. Sorry about that. But if there's any questions, I'll be happy to uh, to try and address them now. Doug, we've got a couple of questions. The first question okay. is, this is only for awards that are administered by DCMA, correct? DLA is different, correct? No. And that's the beauty of Mill Standard 2073. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Everybody's playing out of the should be playing out of the same book. Now that's not to say they don't all have their own little preferences, idiosyncrasies, or or ways of utilizing information. But I mean, I go back to the day when the services and DLA all had their own different standards for packaging, and that was a nightmare at best. At least now, everybody's working out of the mill standard 2073 in one way or another. And so, if you've got a DLA contract that calls out military packaging, it should be following basically the information that we've gone through today. Having said that, DLA is in the middle of a huge change of packaging philosophy, and they've gone to commercial packaging. Um, with with some limited exceptions, some you know, depending upon the items, um, certain critical items, ESD items, shelf life items that have a limited um, storage time frame when they're going to be u uh, useful or, or still in a, a ready for use condition. Those items, even purchased by DLA now, don't qualify for. The commercial packaging, and so they should be packaged in accordance with Mill Standard 2073. But a lot, a huge percentage of DLA contracts now, rather than calling out 
mill standard 2073 like they used to a couple of years ago now reference the ASTM D3951 for commercial packaging. Okay, very good. The second question is from Susan Ballou and it says, this is really excellent information. It is complex material for those of us who only ship small quantities to military sites, however. Would it be possible to follow up at some point with a couple of case studies to walk us through the process from beginning to end, fairly basic scenarios. Well, you're jumping ahead in our series of uh, webinars, and that's good because that's exactly where I intend to go. The next seminar is going to be marking. So you'll see bits and pieces of some of this packaging information in the marking requirements, but it's really going to focus on barcode requirements and RFID. Um, then the third in this webinar series is actually going to pull up solicitation examples and walk those through to the end to the point of displaying the, uh, the applicable packaging materials and the marking applicable to the unit intermediate and exterior container. Um, and so, yes, we'll, we'll get there and, and hopefully uh, to some degree of satisfaction in the third webinar. Great. Thank you. Uh, next question from Dana Berger Davinsky. When it says ASTM D3951, what does that mean? That's the standard or the, the commercial standard that is used to specify commercial packaging um, throughout the DOD typically. There are times when you'll see maybe a contract line that says package in accordance with commercial procedures or something like that. And there's really no definition to the requirement at that point. But in order to try to come up with some framework for commercial packaging, they've adopted the ASTM D3951. And it used to always, for years, the revisions of that document were two pages long. If you look at Mill Standard 2073, it's literally hundreds of pages <laughs> of specifications and requirements. That, that right away is the first difference between military packaging and commercial packaging. The commercial packaging spec now has grown to three pages long, but that's only because they've included a, a table of acceptable or recommended shipping containers that can be used. But it's, it's still very general. It doesn't call out specific materials or methods, um, but just has general guidelines on protection of the item um, and storage for time frames up to a year. And, and the quantity per unit pack of one unless otherwise specified. Um, it, it, it's a different document and it's a different approach in that, you know, materials and methods aren't specifically called out based upon the item criteria. It, it's kind of up to the contractor to follow the general guidelines included in that rather brief document. But copies of that document, you know, are available either through the ASTM or um, some of the technical libraries uh, may have it, or if you subscribe to like an IHS, one of the industry uh, document services, you can get a copy of that ASTM. We can't provide it because it's a copyrighted document. And to piggyback with that question from Kelly Jordan, um, the question reads, does ASTM D3951 really mean commercial packaging or vendor commercial packaging? It, it is, well, that's a good question. It's commercial packaging, but from a DOD perspective, contractually, you know, we're, that, that's where we expect our packaging requirements to be met. And so if you have a distributor, that's been awarded a contract, they're, they're the ones that we're dealing with and have a contractual linkage to. And so if they get the material from 
their the manufacturer and it's not in a configuration that meets the ASTM D3951, then it's it's incumbent upon them to repackage that material to meet that ASTM. And generally, even though DLA has gone to, and we'll see this movie, gone to commercial packaging, they've retained military marking because it's so critical to identify material. Our depots and warehouses are literally getting shipments from worldwide sources. And for them to identify a shipment, it has to be marked in a structured way that they can readily identify it. They, can, they can't be expected to do a lot of research to try to figure out why this item was shipped to them and what they're supposed to do with it. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions that are really referring to the third party uh, uh, companies that can do the packaging for you. Mike Mason wrote, there are packaging companies that can do all of this for you. And then Dana writes, is there a third party that we could hire that would package our shipments and what would the cost be? Would you happen to know that information? You know, that, that and would you very, refer? That could vary widely. You know, it depends on the item. It might be uh, the commercial packaging might be dropping an item into a, a small two mil Ziploc bag with our 129 barcoded unit pack label on it. Um, or it, it could be fairly expensive if the item is is fairly fragile um, in nature. We still have to have it, you know, in a condition where it can be um, survive the transportation uh, mode. So there are there are companies all over the country that routinely, you know, they recognize the mill standard. 129 marking. They recognize no standard 2073 preservation methods. They have the materials in house, the containers readily available, and so that's a tremendous service to a lot of contractors. That you know, it's awfully hard to ship five items and go out and buy uh, you know all the materials to go along with it if you're not gonna if you're not gonna get another contract for two or three years for that type of item. So mm -hmm. yeah, there we we don't. Typically, try to endorse different companies. You can Google some companies, and we do maintain a listing um, in our in D DCMA of, of packaging houses that we're familiar with and that we've done business with or have visited in the past. And so, but it's it, it's for right at this point, it's organized for the entire country, so it's a rather lengthy list. Um, but we've routinely provided that to like PTAC offices in the past and a lot of the PTAC offices in different areas are also very familiar with uh, the companies that do military packaging and marketing. Yeah. Dana also writes, in many cases we are quoting GSA pricing, we cannot afford to eat the packaging or packing costs. Is this a cost we can pass on? No, that's why the information is, is referenced and identified in the solicitation. It, it's, it depends on what you mean by pass on, I guess. It should be included in the bid. It's not something that we're going to account for after the fact. If, if you're quoting a lot of the GSA requirements, they do have kind of a outfit for DOD shipments, um, different, you know, military packaging may be required. And, and in that case, it should be identified in the solicitation so that it can be accounted for and adjusted in the pricing. Mm -hmm. okay, I mean, they should you. be holding. Yeah, that that covers it. Yeah, uh, David Lomax adds: ASTM is the American Society for Testing Materials. One can download the specification from their website, but it's not free. And then he lists the website as http: www.astm.org/standards. Slash D thirty nine fifty one dot htm. So David Blomax just wanted to add that to our session today, and 
Let's see, we've got other questions. Uh, from Mindy uh, Peterson, how would a company that does the small packaging market themselves? Is there a language or terminology that buyers look for that should be included? Commercial, fast packs, small run boxes? Um, you know, there's there's not a lot of, uh, it, it, it gives me kind of a different approach or a different angle on coming into some of this like some of our depots will go out and purchase containers um, like a fast pack and that sort of thing a lot of them are on GSA schedules in larger volume but um, companies that produce that sort of material to the specifications either you know can sell directly to the government or sell to Folks that are producing whatever material requires those containers, um, but there's not that I know of but like a readily available. I mean, there's spots where you can go in and identify the supply class of the the material in question, and then try to get on like a notification for the, the bidders. But to be honest with you. You folks at the PTAC probably have a better idea uh, on some of that than I do. Doug, it looks like that's the end of our questions. Um, okay. We appreciate your giving our, this valuable presentation to us this morning, and we're looking forward to the other sessions that you're going to provide. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, and we hope you join us next week. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.